There we go. Hello everyone and welcome to the Cisco DevNet Twitch channel. Hey, Kessel Jet, there's Jeff over there. So my name is Adrian DSU. I'm glad to be here. We're starting a new project within Cisco Developer Relations, DevNet, and we want to start streaming on Twitch. We want to be able to reach folks wherever you are. So you'll see much more content coming, for example, on YouTube. You'll see uh, more blog posts. You see us at events, third party events going out. Uh, and you'll also see us on Twitch. So this is a project that we've talked about for a long time. And we're finally kicking it off. So I'm excited to be the first one to run this. I'm a developer advocate, by the way, with Cisco Developer Relations. I cover enterprise networking. Um, and from enterprise networking, I cover mostly Meraki, Cisco DNA Center, uh, Cisco iOS XC and Cisco SD1. So four main products on the enterprise networking umbrella from Cisco. So the Twitch stream, right, will have it, I mean, at least me, like I said, there might be other colleagues of mine that will stream on this channel, but as it goes for me, I will be streaming on Wednesdays, uh, every Wednesday so far, in case something else comes up, uh, I'll, you know, I'll uh, send out a message on LinkedIn, Twitter, we'll put also uh, a message on the Twitch platform that I'll not, I'm not going to be there, maybe sometimes when something comes up, but I plan on doing this for the foreseeable future. Um, so every Wednesday, like I said, 9, uh, 9 a.m. Pacific. And we'll run it for an hour, right? And I want to cover real world use cases around network automation. You know, people keep talking about network automation. It means different things for different people. So I'll show you what I understand and what it means for me. Uh, the projects that I've worked on, the sessions will be totally unscripted. I mean, not completely unscripted, but we'll have a subject that we want to talk about, and then we'll go and you know, we'll start getting it done. There will be issues for sure. I mean, I'm sure there will be, uh, but that's fine. That's just real life. We'll troubleshoot them. We'll try to fix them and we'll progress right and we'll learn all of us i'm for sure gonna learn a lot right i hope you will join and learn also with me uh you know ask questions at any point and um if anything comes up just drop a message in the chat i see there jeff can you hear me well can you see me over there all good I hope you can. And uh, let me just see quickly. Yeah, cool. Perfect. So, um, like I said, the channel will be mostly, I mean, when I stream around network automation, right? Real world network automation and scripted. We'll hit the issues, we'll go over them, we'll troubleshoot, but we'll start the series of uh, streams with configuring a CI/CD pipeline, right? For network automation or infrastructure automation. So uh, a CI/CD, we keep hearing about this term also, continuous integration, continuous development. Um, it's basically, you know, CICD pipelines have been there for quite a while. They've been mostly used by software developers to deploy their applications kind of in an automated fashion, right? So um, 
back in the day many moons away right when developer teams had you know qa team engineers and then build teams and then it would developers and that process of developing software right giving it to a build team the build team taking the source code building the actual application then giving it to a qa team and then the qa team would take the application would test it would do quality assurance testing on it uh, would raise bugs right would go back to the developer so it was a fairly manual process in which the application the source code would go from one team to the next team and so on and so forth uh, so all these steps throughout the years have been kind of automated um, and automated in the sense that the software developer writes the source code right but then that source code gets pushed into a central repository a central location on a server and usually that push of code on the central location triggers what we call a pipeline so what used to be done by the build team before right now it's done automatically as part of this pipeline so when you hear about continuous integration continuous development pipelines it's that part of you know taking the code and building the application in an automated fashion testing it also in an automated fashion you have the tests where you predefine uh, once you write the code and then you know if the build is successful uh, the automatic build process is successful then it moves on to testing so you get your testing automated testing done as part of your pipeline then you move to um, a sandbox environment it could be right so you would have a test environment where you push that application and you do additional testing in that sandbox and if you're happy with the tests and everything works as expected then you can push that application and have it you know deployed in your production environment so these pipelines are used extensively by companies like you know amazon facebook google cisco uh, there's a lot of these large companies that have a big uh, web presence right and they have uh, multiple application multiple features yeah, so it's very common for them to use these pipelines, for example, to deploy a new feature on, on their websites. For Facebook, it could be, you know, uh, a button or whatever it is. They can easily deploy it faster using these pipelines. The feature has been developed. There's an addition to the website. They're able to deploy it with this pipeline um, with the peace of mind in the sense that it's being tested as part of the pipeline, right? So there's a lot of tests that have been automatically run over this, uh, over the new feature, so it just gets pushed. So we're gonna start with how can we use this, these pipelines, right, that software developers have been using for many, many years now. How can we use them as part of our, our network automation and our just you know day-to-day -day configuration of our infrastructure of our networks can we take advantage of what developers have been using for for many years and kind of tag along and use the same technology for our automation efforts right so that's what i'm going to start with my stream we're going to go and we're going to build a csd pipeline from scratch so no previous knowledge of pipelines or anything like that is is expected so you're you know, welcome to follow along uh, if you're on the stream you're welcome to ask questions as we follow along and we go along here and uh, the stream is also recording so I have this saved what I'm doing so if you want to watch it uh, after we have the live session right you can go back and and have a look at the recording and you know bring your questions into the next session or you can find me on Twitter like I said LinkedIn drop me a message a question and I'm more than happy to help out so this 
CICD pipeline building from scratch is going to take us, depending on, you know, how many issues and how much troubleshooting we have to do. I'm expecting something like six, seven weeks. It's a fairly, fairly convoluted and um, a lot of pieces you'll see come into the picture to get this pipeline going. And after that, I'm just going to go and show you what I'm working on, right? I'm going to show you projects that I work on. I'm going to show you how to use the Cisco DNA Center Python SDK. For example, I right, will have a session on that. I'll show you how to use the Meraki Python SDK to start configuring and automating your Meraki and your DNA Center deployments. I'll show you the Sastry SDK for SD-WAN, how to start using that. Um, I'll show you if you don't have test environments where you can find them in our sandboxes on DevNet. So that's down the road, right? That's coming. It's going to be down the road this year, but I wanted to start with the CSD pipelines. So I've also wrote a series of blogs. I've wrote three so far on the CSD pipelines project here, right? So you can find more information and read more about them on, on blogs.cisco.com slash developer. If you look up my name, you'll find them. Um, so this is the first one in the series and it kind of explains what's continuous integration, delivery, deployment, and this is how it's gonna look once we get it running in our uh, in our setup here. It's basically a, a GitLab community edition installation. And the nice thing with GitLab community edition is that it has a pipeline component already built in, right? So GitLab is a very popular version control system, right? Similar to GitHub, you know, GitHub.com, uh, GitLab is one of their competitors. And the nice thing with GitLab is that you can install it in your own environment, right? Uh, they have a binary, you can install it uh, and you can configure your own central version control system. You can have the pipeline component as part of it and it comes already, you know, pre-built within GitLab. So that's really nice and that's what we're gonna use for our pipeline. So why would you use, right? There's a couple of uh, reasons why would you use a, a pipeline for deployment of infrastructure. We're gonna use a Cisco CML. So we're gonna go over in our sessions here on the Twitch stream and talk about Cisco CML at some point down the road. Um, gonna see if you folks want me to install it, start from scratch. There's some installation videos out there, but if you want me to start from scratch, we can install it from scratch. I already have a setup with CML that I'm running. Um, so we'll go and talk in CML in more detail, what it use, what you can use it for, uh, where you can get it, how much it costs, how to install it, right? How to get it working, how to connect your outside network to your virtual um, network in here. So I have, you see a bunch of devices here interconnected between them, virtual instances of switches and routers. So I'll show you how to interconnect them, how to bring them the, the outside world, how to connect to them uh, from outside, how to connect from them to the internet, right? We'll talk about that too. And then as part of the pipeline, we'll talk about also Ansible and how to use Ansible to kind of build your Ansible playbooks for automation purposes. We'll talk about PyTS, right? Cisco PyTS, which is a testing framework from Cisco and the advantages that it has and how to use it. So we'll talk about all these different technologies and how they come together as part of our pipeline. Um, so that's the first one. Then I have the part two of that series. Right, so we start talking about how to install GitLab to C. So that's what we're gonna do today. I'll show you uh, how to do that. Uh, we'll talk about uh, Docker also, and let's see if we can get GitLab running by the end of the day to, to get basically this window. We have our installation of GitLab, right, running and ready to go. And then in part three, I went over and I was talk talking about how to use GitLab C and how to define uh, the pipeline components in GitLab. 
right? So there's four, uh, three, three stages, stages actually that our pipeline will have pre-snapshot of the infrastructure before we do any changes, deploying a specific change, and then taking a post-snapshot of our infrastructure, making sure that the change we've done has been successfully approved. In this example, it's just deploying our SPF, so we'll make sure that the OSPF routes are propagated throughout all the network, all the devices get the new routes, the routing table is converged, and um, on all the devices, and they have that new route uh, as part of the routing table. So this could be, you know, we have, we'll have an example with an OSPF routing instance. It could be anything, any change you want. Uh, if you folks, you know, want to try something and we want us to try it together here and build a playbook for configuring something else, we can do that too, but we'll start with the OSPF one. Uh, all right, then we'll go ahead and we'll see how you can define the CICD pipeline stages in GitLab, right? We'll cover this, we'll go over all of this, what it means, uh, where you can find the scripts, we'll build the scripts from scratch, We'll look at the artifacts that come out of uh, PyTS. And we'll also have a look after that at Ansible and, and all these uh, other tools coming into the picture. All right. Uh, Passion Tapper, cool. Glad, Glad to see you joined. Uh, hope, hope you find this useful. useful. All, right, all right, so, so let's, let's get started. started. Right, we're going to start with um, deploying CentOS. Right, so I'm going to have my pipeline GitLab C running in a virtual machine. So you see here, I'm on macOS. So this is I have a Mac laptop. This is the operating system of choice. Doesn't really matter. It could be Windows, Linux, whatever. But I'm going to deploy all the components that I need for my pipeline within the virtual machine. I want to keep it separate, right? I don't want to mess my operating system with, uh, with GitLab and all of that. So I'm just going to deploy a new virtual machine. I have parallels here that I'm using. You could be using VMware. You could be using VirtualBox, right? As a free alternative to this. <clears throat> you could be using anything you want. Uh, just, you know, deploy a virtual machine. I'm using Parallels. And I'm going to do a new virtual machine here. And I'm going to install a uh, CentOS. Right? I'm going to go with this. Um, I like CentOS. Right? If you folks know, they kind of they had the drama happening with Red Hat. Um, I'm still a fan of CentOS, even after all the changes that they've done with the upstream, downstream, right? When CentOS is being launched, it used to be launched after Red Hat and was pretty much you know, very similar, having the same binaries, the same components as Red Hat. And Red Hat would be your enterprise solution it comes with the support you know all of that and then CentOS would be kind of like the open source free version of Red Hat it used to be downstream so Red Hat would be released first and CentOS would be released very similar the same packages like I said almost the same but you you know they would change the images the branding would be changed but uh, deep down would be the same exact thing. So now they changed it, they they have CentOS, they call it upstream. So that means that they're kind of testing in CentOS all the packages, binaries, and then once they've been tested and everything is, uh, is working as they're expecting it, then they go and they have the Red Hat release kind of after they've tested it with CentOS. Doesn't really matter for us. It was just a bit of uh, our history. I like CentOS. I liked it. I'm a big fan for many years. Um, I'm an even even bigger fan of OpenBSD, but that's a story for another time. Um, so let's go and download CentOS Linux. Right. I'm going to do a next year CentOS Stream Nine. 
it's fine. So this is the latest one. Uh, package size and packed. Right. So I'm just gonna go and download it. It's going ahead, pulling down the CentOS image. Bad time for the kids. We'll catch up on the video on that later. One subject. Perfect. Got to have you on. So let's see. Ten, 10 seconds. seconds. Validating, coming up. And I mean, like I said, you can find, right, CentOS download, for example, if you go and look, uh, go CentOS mirrors, if you don't have parallels. And seven, nine other mirrors. Uh, no, this is CentOS seven. Why are we sent to a seven? Let's go download. So we would have same thing here, right? So CentOS Linux, you see version seven, that was 2009 and before. And now after the upstream downstream change has happened with Red Hat, they went to CentOS stream. They call it version eight. I also have it in here and cannot access the microphone that's fine doesn't need to so version 8 the, the latest one is version 9 here so you can easily download it from here based on the architecture you are, you're running right you would download it uh, as an iso actually i'm not going to download this because i already have it but you would download it as an iso mounted in your virtual box vmware uh whatever you, you know virtualization solution you're using and um, and get started that way. With parallels is nice because you saw I just needed to do new, select, I want uh, a CentOS installation, next, continue, pull it down and install it and I have a parallels account uh, and I integrate a new password, right? it's a brand new installation so i'm just gonna create a password here and let's see it's coming online there we go welcome i'm not gonna take a tour now you can take it if you want later and i'm gonna install actually the parallels tools so the new password that i just created it's gonna go ahead and install Parallels Tools and once this is done, we'll just reboot CentOS and then we'll install the updates also because there might be some updates. So this Parallel Tools is similar to you know VMware Tools or KVM, right? This is just a set of packages that are getting installed by Parallels to be able to more closely integrate with the parallels integration with the operating system that you're installing. So is, you know, we're talking about um, here the mouse, the keyboard, we're talking about um, the resolution, right? The graphical interface, uh, you can resize it, um, so it's just, series of packages that Parallels installs in your operating system, in your virtual machine, to make sure that you get the best experience out of this. I'm sure you folks know by now, VMware Tools does the same thing. Um, KVM, right, they have the same thing, just a series of packages that you get installed to make your experience better uh, between your virtual machine, your, your guest operating system, and your host operating system, in which my case is um, parallels. All right. Who else we have here? Anyone else joined? Come here. So as we go through this, right, I'm new to OBS. So I'm using OBS Studio to stream this. And um, 
it's a hell of a piece of software. software. I'm gonna gotta say, <laughs> a lot of knobs. Um, so I'm learning as we go. Also with with streaming and OBS, we tested this uh, before. You should be able to hear me and see me well. Um, but yeah, I need yeah, to figure out a way to actually, actually I have the chat integrated, but I want to have it integrated as part of the stream. All right, so I have it somewhere here on the side of the window uh, so I can, you know, folks can see the chats going on. And um, even if you don't have an account, for example, you're not logged into Twitch, you can still see the chat happening. It's something that I'm looking at, uh, at doing and getting for our next session is just having the chat here uh, on the side of the window. All right, come on, Parallels Tools. <coughs> Let me see, oh, there we go. Okay, so I'm just gonna restart this, making sure Parallels Tools are getting installed and working. So I'll be able to actually resize this once it logs in. It will automatically change the resolution, right, because of uh, the tools. Um, networking is also more tightly integrated after you install the tools. All right, so let me log back in. And next, like I said, let's update the operating system. It's a brand new installation of CentOS. Let's see if there's any updates. So we'll search for updates. We'll go under updates and there's OS updates. We see here there's some of them. So we're just gonna download them all, make sure we have the latest packages as part of CentOS 9. Let me see if I have connectivity to the internet I also. So, so by, by default, default the networking, networking is set up by parallels. Let's, let's see if it is actually. actually. There we go. Okay, so it is. And to see how it's set up, right, you would go just and check the settings. Hardware, you would go under networking. So it's a shared network, which is the recommended one, right? So this is just uh using the same network that i have as part of my laptop so it's sharing the network and automatically does the routing between the virtual machine my networking on the host right on my mac os to the outside world so that's automatically done for if you want to change it you will change it from here if you want to disconnect disable your network interface will be there, right? Host only, if you want to make it only that host, then you have, uh, you could have different hosts. Uh, as part of this, you can have different virtual machines in that host only network. Uh, then you have your default adapter for bridged, right? So you can have it as netted or bridged. I'm just gonna leave it netted. Okay, so this is done. Let me restart and update again. Restart and install everything. All right, so once this installs, let's go and uh, check. Next, I'm gonna install Docker on the CentOS because we're gonna install, following that, GitLab CE, the GitLab Community Edition, but the Docker version of it, right? I like Docker, uh, I like the fact that um, you can very easily spin up a Docker image, right? Modify it and then destroy it once you're done with it, or you can have it running. It's much more easier to update. Also, I have a, a Plex installation here, which I don't know if you know, it's a media server. So Plex, I'm running it on, on Docker also, and it's extremely nice <coughs> to be able to just, when there's a new version out, I just destroy the old version, right? Docker remove, Docker stop, Docker remove, and then just pull it out and get a, a new image going. All right, so let's 
let me see is it coming back online it's installing updates so let's go ahead and check Uh, CentOS 9 install Docker. Okay, we're gonna install Docker next on CentOS. Uh, and we're gonna go Docker Engine. And I also want Docker Compose install from a package. Where is it? And then uninstall. Okay, so we're just gonna. Use yum install, right? Docker engine uh, container D, and then also Docker compose plugin. So uh, we're gonna start it, and then we're gonna check that it works by running a that hello world container. Uh, this is what I'm gonna check. Okay, so it says 46. And I also want to once I install it. I want to have it run every time CentOS restarts. So, what we do? CentOS nine run Docker every restart. I restart. Stop. So, so run Docker, how can we ask this? this? How to enable to restart, restart with Docker, Docker container? No, that's not what I want. Um, start containers automatically. Docker run, always restart. Start Docker. Demon CentOS 9. Every reboot. That's it. This configure the demon prescribe. World to flush changes. You start Docker. No. What about this? Well, let's see. Whenever I turn on my laptop for reboot, I restart Docker demo first with sudo sys restart. Okay. This is. Yeah, this is not what we want. Plus, it's pretty old. Uh, can I start up the system reboot? Docker first to start. Uh, let's see. Docker first to start after reboot. Is there still an echo going on? Setting. What about now? No, it's not open anywhere else. Change the settings on this. What about now? Okay. Test again a bit later. Uh, all, all right, right. So, so this is still installing updates for CentOS. Uh, so, so how do we? Um, restart the stop Docker container. 
System D. Okay, what about this? Right, we want to be the Docker process basically to restart automatically after every reboot. Right, so that's what I want. Prepare the environment. What does it show me here? Configure the containers with system D, yes. But they're using pod man. Uh, no, I don't want to use pod man. What are the options we have? Docker service start after server restart. Uh, let's see on Ubuntu. Restart condition any, we should start your containers in case of system failure or reboot in this case. Docker daemon doesn't start when you reboot the machine, to achieve you should do something as follows. We'll give it a try, although it's for Ubuntu. We'll give that one a try. This one is installing. Let me go back, open this in a new tab. Restart Docker service. Is that gonna to start that? I uh, really need to ensure the following things: ensure Docker demo restarts. Okay, let's see this one. Docker demo restarts on system reboot. Ensure Docker container has restart policy configured. Docker update restart always. And then the container ID or the container name. Okay, so we're gonna try with this enable Docker service. After we install it, I will give it a try. Let's see. All right, so has it been updated? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so it's updated. Let me log back in. So I'm logged in, right? I have a fairly fresh installation of CentOS. I installed the Parallels tools. I should be able to resize this now nicely. The resolution will change automatically. There we go. Uh, software updates have been installed. So I've installed all the updates for CentOS, right? Uh, we check the networking, how it's configured. And actually one more thing, because the resources here, yeah, there's two processors, two virtual CPUs, and then two gigs of memory. It's really not that much for uh, for this installation, so I'm just gonna bump that up. I'm gonna give it four virtual CPUs and four gigs of memory. So I'm just gonna do a sudo uh, shutdown halt now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop, stop it, it, resize. There we go. So I'm gonna go here and bump it up to four. And this also, I'll make it four gigs. Uh, because I've seen before, two virtual CPUs and two gigs of RAM is kind of, it works, but it's struggling. So now it should be better. Rebooting, come on. And we'll go and install Docker and then we'll start building our Docker Compose for GitLab C and Runner. Okay, there we go. Let me log back in. Spectre V2. But, uh, um, it was like, it was like three, four years ago, ago Spectre, Spectre, right? With like the, the, the Intel CPUs it was a nasty bug affecting virtual machines. So I'm still on a Mac OS with Intel CPU. 
I have a PC refresh coming up next year, so getting those MacBook Pros, we probably next year they'll have the M3 maybe. So that's coming up next year for me. Uh, we have a PC refresh every so many years. All right, so now I think I'm ready with the CentOS. I have my tools installed. I have my CPU bumped up, the memory. So now let's go ahead and install Docker. So I'm just going to go. And another nice thing, having Parallels tools, is that you can copy paste from one, so from your host operating system, should be, just click on that. I should be able to paste it in here. All right, so I'm opening a terminal, I have a sudo. Oh, maybe not. Let me see if I copy like this. No? So I spoke too soon. Copy paste between them is apparently not working. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to open Firefox in here. Uh, just to make it easier to copy paste. I'm going to go to Google. CentOS 9 Docker install. Install Docker Engine, so it's the same website, Install Docker Engine, so we have this. Uh, copy, paste, so we're installing Docker, Docker Compose, and all the prerequisites. Enable to find a match. Uh, Why? Let's do Docker and install update. Yeah, I'm update. Dependencies resolved, nothing to do. Hmm, okay, so we, we hit the first snag pretty quick here. <laughs> uh, unable to find a match. Why? Let's see, did we skip something? Install using, oh, okay, hold on. So we skipped this part, which is adding the repo, right? So the YAML tools first. I kind of jumped a couple of steps. So we'll install, install YAML tools first in the package and then you actually have to specify the repo for docker manually and add it as your part of your yum config manager all right so yum utils is installed now i can do uh, the next one which is adding the docker repo because what happened here right it didn't find the uh, docker engine, the Docker Compose in the repos that already had pre-configured as part of CentOS. So we have to manually add the Docker repo in here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and add the Docker repo. And now I should be able to install Docker C because he knows where to find them. There we go. I guess that was an easy one. We'll install Docker, we'll start it, and we'll test it. Uh, yes, I want to install everything. Docker and all the prerequisites that come with it. Um, coming up here, seven, five, seven out of 11. Hope you folks can hear me and uh, there's no more echo. Uh, is this okay, the signature? I believe there is. You would have, uh, actually, there you go. 
9F35 is right there. The GPG key signature, so I know that I'm installing the right Docker CE, right? From the right spot, from the right repo. I have the fingerprint and it matches 9F35, what they have there. So I know I'm not installing you know, some malicious uh, Docker or anything like that. So it's signed and it's coming from the right repo. All right. And it is GPG sign. Good stuff. Talking about digital signatures, I was like a couple of years ago, they broke the MD5, right? So at least the, the one with the smallest key, right? So you could actually fake MD5 signatures and have them, the actual, you know, string for an MD5 checksum you could modify them, right? And you could basically push malware. So that's why you know, they move to a SHA as a checksum mechanism, right? Or GPG. So just keep in mind, if you're using like old MD5 still for checksum verification, I recommend you double check your images where you get them from. Uh, okay, so this has been installed, Docker is installed, Docker Compose, Container D, so we have all of that. Let's uh, start Docker. So if I do a sudo docker ps, it's not running. So let's start it. Copy, paste. Is it running now? It is running now. I don't have any images, anything. So let's make sure that it's running by running that simple hello world image. It's gonna go because the image is now locally available. Went to Docker Hub, pulled the image, ran it, and there we go, that's what we have. So now let's see like I said, we have Docker running, right? Install running. Let's see if we can actually enable it for uh, whenever we reboot. So the Docker starts automatically. So we have system CTL, enable Docker. And when you run the service, is to pass or restart condition any. So let's see if I'm going to run it again. Start restart condition. doesn't have this option okay so once we start we'll see if it comes up or not automatically if not then we'll we'll investigate at that point all right so i have my docker install i have my centos let's now start uh, building a docker compose to install gitlab c and the running process so here i'm going to go into actually Make a, do I have a source directory here? No. Let's make a new directory source, change into it. And here I'm gonna make another directory, uh, which is create environment. Cause we're gonna create the, our environment, right? It's gonna be GitLab CE as part of this. So I'm gonna change directory into that. And uh, let's go ahead and create that Docker Compose file. 
So I have touch Docker Compose dot YAML. So Docker Compose, if you don't know, is just is part of Docker, of course, and it's just a way of concatenating different services and starting them at the same time or one depending on the other. So it gives you the option of creating these YAML files in which you define, you know, what you want Docker to install, what images you want to run, how to pass parameters between your images, um, how to mount the volumes, right, uh, environment variables, how to pass them between. So it's when you do Docker Compose, right, it's gonna look for this Docker dash compose.yaml file. So it kind of has to be pretty fine and it has to be created in a certain way. So we're gonna just go ahead and create our Docker Compose file. So I'm gonna use VI, right? And for Docker Compose, we start with version and the latest version is 3.8. And I can also find here Docker Compose version. All right, so we're 3.8 kind of running Docker Engine 1903. So let's see. Oh, we're already running Docker version 2302. So everything above 1903 would be version 3.8. And what happens with these versions for our Docker Compose file is that with each version of Docker Engine, right, there's new features that are being added. So by specifying the version um, in your Docker Compose file, you're just telling Docker, hey, take advantage of all the features that have come with, you know, version 3.8, for example, if we scroll down, right, for each new version, you see it introduces the following additional parameters. So you have secrets. It's part of version 3.1. 3.2, right, you have the following additional parameters as version 3.2 of your Docker Compose. So 3.3, 3.4, and so on and so forth. 3.8, we're gonna use, uh, introduces new parameters. It is only available with Docker Engine version 1903 and higher. We are, we are at 2302, so we're fine. Uh, introduces the following additional parameters, so max replicas per node, template driver, driver, right, and all of that. So if you want to take advantage of all these other new features, then that's the way to do it. Declare uh, the version at the top of your Docker Compose file. Then I want the following services to be installed as part of my Docker Compose file. First of all, I want my GitLab, right? So I'm calling it GitLab. Restart, I want my GitLab Docker image to restart always. The image that it should use, the Docker image, uh, is GitLab, GitLab C. So get it from the GitLab folder, the GitLab community edition, host name, I'm gonna call it GitLab. Right, the volumes that I'm gonna mount, so this is just mounting volumes from your local machine into the, God, the, the Docker environment. So the volumes that I'm gonna mount are gonna be two of them. So I have my GitLab config, and I'm gonna mount it into Etsy. So the local GitLab config, I'm gonna mount it into Etsy GitLab, right? Then I'm gonna have a GitLab data, and I'm gonna mount it 
into var apt gitlab so where do you get all this data you basically look on how to deploy gitlab with um, docker right so they will give you an example of hey these are the options that you need to configure so the volumes is just specifying which volumes locally will be mounted within the, the docker uh, image okay so then after that i have the ports so these are ports that are network ports like tcp udp transport layer ports that are being forwarded between my local machine right in this case centos and the docker image so the docker container so i'm going to have ports port 80 on centos right will be forwarded to port 80 on on your docker container all right so let's make sure there's nothing listening on 80 that's that dash m grab for let's grab for 80 uh, so there's not nothing listening on port 80 right i don't have a web server or anything running and that's that is just a, a linux command used for checking the ports both udp and tcp that are running on your machine right so just that's that dash an and i grab for port 80 i don't have anything so if i don't grab for anything right you'll see what ports are opened on the centos box so i have it's listening on port 631 is this thing for ssh right on 22 uh it's established so this is probably my browser connection right on 443 uh, i have both ipv4 and ipv6 right tcp v4 and v6 here listening on pretty much the same port 631 22 and 111 and then i have some udp ports and then i have here the sockets and for the sockets we have container d right so these are daemon sockets these are just socket processes running on this centos box all right so nothing is listening on port 80 so i can forward it if you would have a web server running here right on port 80 uh on your centos machine then you would you know do an 80 80 because you don't want to have an overlapping of ports if it's already used right use another one but in my case nothing is used i'm on 80 80 uh, i'm on 80 so i can forward between port 80 on uh, on centos to port 80 on the docker uh, in the docker container right so once i start my gitlab installation in the docker container right it's going to have a web interface and that interface is going to run on port 80. I'm not going to install certificates or it's just a lab environment. But if you would have to uh, have a production environment, you would definitely have, you know, 443 forwarded here and you have the certificate, your own certificate installed and you will do, you know, 443 forwarded to 443. If 443 is free on CentOS um, and, you know, that's pretty much how you would forward ports between um, to be able to connect on processes running your Docker container. Um, so we're 9.59, we're kind of, oops, let me, we're kind of top of the hour. Um, so I'm actually gonna stop here. We didn't install CentOS, uh, with GitLab C, but we did install CentOS, we get it up to date, we installed Docker, Right, we start Docker Compose and then we start creating our Docker Compose file. So, and then we're gonna install it as part of Docker Compose our GitLab C and then the run process that comes with GitLab and we'll see how they you know, play together in our next session next Wednesday. So top of the hour, thanks to everyone so much for joining. 
right? Um, looking forward to next week, and we'll keep going for where I left off. I'm just gonna, you know, stop, save the files, stop everything, and next week I'm gonna start also creating um, a GitHub con uh, a GitHub repo for us, and I'm gonna upload all these files over there as as we make progress. Cool. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. See you on the next one. See you next Wednesday. Take care.